Tonight's top EU stories from the unit website include EU banks shrink assets by $1.1 trillion. European Union strikes deal on tough new anti-tobacco rules. And Germany revives the European Union treaty change debate. EU promotes renewable energy in data centres, plus a speech for Greece. I'm Rick Timmis and this is the Unit Nightly News. First, from our homepage. European banks have shed more than $1.1 trillion worth of assets since the end of 2011 in a shift away from risky investments such as asset-backed debt as regulators push lenders to shore up their balance sheets. Lenders reduced assets weighted for risk by $817 billion between December 2011 and June 2013. The European Banking Authority, the bloc's top banking regulator, said in a report on Monday. Well, this is just fantastic mumbo-jumbo double-fiscal fudgery moodle jabberwockery. <laughs> Shed, meaning let go, got rid of. Assets, meaning debts, which is a new one on me. I thought a debt was a liability. Well, I suppose if you're the debtor, then it is. But if you're the creditor, then it isn't. So, asset-backed debt. What's that, then? A financial security backed by a loan, lease or receivables against assets other than real estate and mortgage-backed securities for investors, asset-backed securities are an alternative to investing in corporate debt. Excellent. So we're all clear now then? No, we're not clear. OK, well, let's look at it this way. An ABS or asset-backed security is essentially the same thing as a mortgage-backed security, except that the securities backing it are assets such as loans, leases, credit card debt, a company's receivables, royalties and so on, and not mortgage-based securities. Yes, so it's very straightforward. An ABS is an asset backed by a loan, which is a debt. Great, but what does it all mean? Well, what it means is that the banks have dumped $1.1 trillion worth of mortgage loans they were holding on the books. Hmm. So how does that make it a good thing? Well, let's say that you thought the economy might tank and people wouldn't be able to pay their loans, i.e. mortgages, credit cards, etc. Then in a collapsed economy, the price of houses drops, as do sales. Now, if you're a bank, the last thing you want is a bunch of mortgages on your books that aren't getting paid, for which you, if you foreclosed on the assets, would lose money and probably wouldn't even be able to sell. So, as you can see, this is a positive, uplifting story with a positive outlook, if you're a banker. European Union diplomats approved new anti-tobacco legislation on Wednesday, including larger health warnings on cigarette packets and the bloc's first rules on electronic cigarettes. The new rules are designed to make smoking less attractive, particularly to the young. In a bid to reduce the estimated 700,000 tobacco-related deaths in Europe each year. Now hang on a minute, let me grab my time tunnel viewing machine. So, in December last year I reported Ladies and gentlemen, the UK government has been subverted and it is lying to us all. This is not limited to the darker halls of power. It goes all the way to the top, all the way to the Prime Minister himself. David Cameron, let me reveal just who is calling the shots when it comes to UK control and governance. In June this year, our research team revealed an amendment to EU legislation with regard to plain packaging on tobacco products, including cigarettes. Now, through corporate lobbying, the EU directive to enforce plain packaging on all cigarettes across the EU was dropped from the EU directive. And, as supporting evidence to demonstrate that the UK Parliament is, pa is a powerless puppet show for which we are paying vast sums in taxes, I submit this article from our legislation ar our archives. Now, and finally, thanks to all the hard work from our webmaster, Andrew, I can now include a link to our daily newsletter where we first broke this story on tobacco. Well, the net result is that, that as the EU shifts this legislation, then David Cameron changes stance, standing in the public papers trying to make up that he's writing the policies. But he isn't. He's actually following the mandates of the European Union legislation. And that legislation is there for you to see on our website. Cheers, top dog Dave Cameroni, and thanks for all the fish.
German Chancellor Angela Merkel has revived the idea of EU treaty change ahead of a summit in Brussels aimed at agreeing on binding reform contracts. We have a situation in Europe where Germany is often accused of balking at certain developments. This is not the case, she said. We are amongst those who say that we must change the treaties if their legal base is insufficient, she told the German Parliament on Wednesday, 18th of December. Now, changing the EU treaties is a complicated and lengthy process, and once completed, several countries, including Germany, have a requirement to hold national referendums if there is a substantial transfer of competencies from national to EU level. Now, I'm working on a special report that will attempt to uncover the deception behind David Cameron sometime in 2017, if Conservatives get into power, and, well, if we've possibly renegotiated a new EU deal, yada, 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 you get the picture. Here at the unit, we think this new treaty drafting will have an important part to play in this story. So stay tuned and we'll keep you posted. Environmental groups have criticised data centres for using dirty energy, but the European Union has kicked off a three-year project to help them switch across to more renewable energy sources, especially on-site generation by sun, wind and biomass. Apple is using solar power and Britain's Infinity has tried to market a biomass powered data centre, but many data centre operators simply don't examine the options. The Renew IT project, which is part funded with 3.6 million euros from the European Union, aims to help data centre owners build the business case for using on-site energy sources. Of course, it's all well and good on a midsummer's day, but surfing Tinternet on a wet and rainy winter's day will be no fun at all if your data centre has been signed off sick with SAD syndrome due to a lack of sun. Now, I'm wondering how I managed to miss this brilliant letter from Jim Reynolds. We always look to cover your letters as much as we possibly can, so do please keep them coming. Jim writes about his visit and speech to the people of Greece, and here's an excerpt. I come to Greece in full-hearted friendship for the Greek people and for our colleagues from all over Europe who are fighting for the return of democratic self-government to their countries and deliverance from their debt slavery enforced by that imperial project, the Euro currency. We in the campaign for an independent Britain are from all parties and none. We come from right, left and centre. All we want back is our country. Our country has been betrayed by certain Prime Ministers. Edward Heath, in 1972, took us into what was then a common market on a narrow vote in Parliament of 309 to 301, whilst concealing from all MPs the terms of entry. Harold Wilson, in 1975, claimed he had secured new terms of membership and aided by a lavishly funded campaign, the full support of the BBC and almost all British newspapers, he secured a 67% vote by 65% of the electorate to stay in. Now, in 1983, the men who later became Prime Ministers, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, gained their seats in Parliament for the first time by promising, if elected, to take us out of the European Union, but changed their minds when they were elected. This is a brilliant letter from Jim, and you can read the full article on our website. The links are below. Now, speaking of letters, Tony Woodcock wrote in with a copy of his letter to Toby Young, entitled EU Empire. Here's an excerpt. If Red Ed does succeed in turning Britain into a tawdry outpost of the EU Empire, are you not missing the point entirely here? I have been arguing inside the Tory party for the last 20 years that the Maastricht Treaty made it clear Britain would become a subservient province of an anti-democratic EU Empire. It has happened already. Ministers have been pretending to govern us, but have really simply been satraps ruling as provincial governors. The process is now being understood by all Brits who are interested in what is happening. Abu Qatada, open borders, idiot policies on wind farms, you name it. It all originates in Brussels and is passed to us by shoddy, backstairs horse trading in the Council of Ministers. All ministers for 40 years have been complicit, pretending they are in charge of policy when they are not. Regarding the famed offer of a referendum, Mr Cameron gave Nick Clegg a referendum on 
alternative voting within a year of office. Again, it was a shoddy deal that could have wrecked our constitutional political system. When Alex Salmond demanded Scottish independence, he gave way immediately in another shoddy deal that could wreck the union. When 80% in polls asked for a referendum on the EU, he first whipped his party to stop it, then realising he was in the doo-doos, came up with this plan that if, 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 blah, 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 we could have a referendum. Even Conservative supporters can smell a stitch-up coming down the line. Whichever party wins next time, alone or in concert with the Lib Dems, nothing will change. We shall still have a tawdry, provincial, vichyvite government. The only solution is for voters to shed tribal voting and take back control of their Anglo-Saxon parliament from top-down rule from the continent, where it has been put by Conservatives and acquiesced in by Labour. Change most of the monkeys in the cage. Regards, Tony. Ah, uh, just a classic. Tony, absolutely inspirational stuff. You're a star. What exquisite use of great British diction. Now, if you can write them like that, Tony, then keep them coming. I'm Rick Timmis, reporting for the unit Nightly News. I'll see you soon.